hour. All right. Welcome. My name is Paul Edison Lam. I'm the communications director for the Geological Society of the Oregon Country. Uh, we are the oldest collaboration of amateurs and professional geologists in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, we have been uh, pulling over and stopping at outcrops to look at the rocks for uh, over, over 86 years now. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for joining the meetup. This isn't a membership organization, but you don't have to be a member to attend the meetup. You don't have to be a member to, uh, to come to one of our lectures, our monthly Friday night lectures. Uh, membership is required for field trips, but you're welcome to, uh, to join these anytime. Uh, coming up again, this 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 hour will be recorded. Then then at one o'clock we turn the recording off, and then we we take general questions and more conversation, and people can return to the breakout rooms if they want. Ask your questions in the chat, Carol. You're going to be fielding the questions in the chat as they come in, and uh, I think we're going to hold some of those until the end because we want to get through Andrew's presentation, and then we have our special guests today, Shannon Doolin and John Lehman are out of town guests from the Don't Panic Geoscience podcast. What do we do this month or this year? Well, as some of you know, we, we saved a state agency uh, with the help of industry and uh, Yume Wong and Clark and Scott and many others who put the, our effort into saving the this Department of Geology and Mineral Industries from the governor's chopping block. Now we're still engaged in the budget issue. And if you're burned out on the politics here, you can just ignore this piece, but we are asking for $2.6 million so that we can get these earthquake resilience positions and other scientific positions put back into the budget. So that'll be coming up in this biennial legislative session in the next month or so, you'll probably see another petition and some information about that. What else have we done? Well, we haven't done any in-person field trips. But uh, with actually with Andrew's help and Sheila's help and Shannon's help, I've kind of put to, we put together uh, a virtual field trip, and that's the Google Map that has the little videos on it, and that's something that we did with uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Arthur Glassfield's uh, first geology class ever uh, at Reed College, and uh, I'm a Reed alum, so I'm uh, very proud to contribute to that effort. And thanks to Scott Burns, to Dr. Scott Burns also for his help with that project. Uh, what have we got coming up? Clark, do you want to describe, uh, and maybe Sheila too, what uh, what we're doing in Clackamas? Well, thanks, Paul. Uh, we we like to uh, partner or go out and uh, kind of uh, have outreach with uh, different organizations. And the Clackamas County or the Clackamas River Basin uh, uh, have a um, an idea to put on a year to two year long conference and wow. And they got, uh, we got a steering committee together and uh, Sheila and I, uh, we are part of the geo, the geologic part of it. Uh, Sheila gave a presentation last week that will be on their site as a recording. I follow here in April, April 6th, and I will give a talk on the uh, upper and lower, the geology upper and lower Clackamas Basin. And uh, uh, they're about an hour long, uh, uh, these talks. They, they've been well received. Over 100 people generally join in. But uh, uh, I, and I encourage everyone here to, uh, to, to sign up. It's free and, uh, and enjoy the talks. Paul? And thank you. And Sheila gave a great talk earlier. What was it, two days ago? Or was it last night? I'm not sure about the geology of Oregon. This, that, yeah. This uh, answers Wes's question earlier that we had in the first hour of, well, are we ever going to do that Clackamas field trip that we had planned before COVID and before the whole basin caught fire and push, pushed all of our plans back? We will, I promise, we'll get back to that. Uh, this is part of our project, I think, to focus on less Portland-centric field trips, uh, but we will, we will get around to doing the reconnaissance for that, and I'll I mean, maybe even later in the summer, we could do that. Julie, you want to say anything else about the Clackamas piece? I'm going to talk about the lectures. Um, well, I, I'm just not, I'm pretty sure that they put the, if you're interested in hearing Clark's lecture and you want to hear the, uh, the preamble to it, the basic overview of the geology, I'm pretty sure that they recorded that and it's on their website. Am I correct okay. about that, Clark? 
Yes, you are correct. Okay, okay. Okay, Sheila, I'm just gonna run through the upcoming lectures real quickly, and then we'll get to Andrew's presentation okay. here. Um, so what have we got next? Who's our next speaker? Okay, we've got Bruce Bjornstad, and he is going to talk, of, he's got some great uh, photos. Uh, they're drone pictures taken from above of the uh, trail of the Ice Age floods. So there's nothing, you know, that there's, it, that's incredible. You went, once you know what happened there, you can look down from an airplane, you can see the trail of the floods. And so he's going to uh, show that to all, all of us based on the photos out of his new book. And I hear they're fantastic. I'm looking so forward to that. Speaker for April. For uh, May, we are going to have John Major, who's the scientist, the chief scientist in charge of the Cascade Volcanic Observatory. That's and great. he's going to talk to us about the workings of the CVO, it's called, and how they're uh, working to protect us from volcanic hazards. Okay. And then we have Dr. Emily Cahoon is going to come back with us in June, and Leslie Moklock is going to come and talk to us about her Rocks, Minerals, and Geology of the Pacific Northwest book. Leslie, formerly of the Rice Museum. I'm not going to talk much about field trips because Carol Hasenberg isn't here. She is, I think, at the Oregon coast, and hopefully she's making another one of her wonderful videos. If, we're gonna, if we want to talk more about the uh, field trips, let's do that after the recorded session. So I'm just going to jump through that so I can hand it off to Andrew. Give me a moment while I okay. set that up. And again, uh, ask your questions in the chat. Andrew, I'm gonna try to interrupt you a little uh, fewer times this, this time around. But remember, there are no stupid questions except those questions that begin. <clears throat> well, this is really more of a comment than a question. So anything that you, you know, what, what's the difference between a rock and a mineral? Or what's the difference between hotspot volcanism and slab failure? Uh, all of those questions are, are, are fair game here, so. All right. And, all right. Get this party take started. It, take it away. So my name is Andrew Dunning. I am a master's candidate at Portland State University. I study seismology uh, under Dr. Ashley Strig, and I've been producing this geology news segment for close to a year now. And uh, it's always fun to stay on top of new research and all the fun and exciting things happening across the globe. I'm going to start with earthquakes because earthquakes are my favorite thing. And we had a pretty exciting month for earthquakes. Um, the biggest event in the last month was a magnitude 8.1 in the Kermadec Islands, about a thousand miles, a thousand kilometers north of New Zealand down here. And this is uh, right here. I'm pointing at it. Um, and this was a really interesting sequence. I get notifications on my phone for major earthquakes around the world. And it, the first earthquake that happened that day in New Zealand was down here. It was a magnitude 7.3, um, which is a, a good strong shaker. It wasn't widely felt across New Zealand, but it was a, a strike slip earthquake because the plate tectonics in New Zealand are really complicated. And then about an hour and a half later, we had a magnitude 7.4 uh, earthquake here in the subduction zone, a uh, thousand kilometers north of New Zealand. Now that's far enough away that these two earthquakes aren't related. Uh, from a tectonic stress and strain perspective. Um, but then about an hour after the 7.4, we had a magnitude 8.1, which uh, created a small tsunami. That was a subduction zone thrust, uh, mega thrust earthquake. Uh, might be a stretch to call it a mega thrust because it's an order of magnitude smaller than say, Cascadia or Japan or uh, Chile, uh, but it's still a very large earthquake and it created about a 70 centimeter tsunami that impacted Australia, uh, many of the Pacific Islands and Northern New Zealand. There were other magnitude uh, seven earthquakes across the globe up here in Kamchatka and over here in Japan. This magnitude seven in Japan was one day uh, after the 10th anniversary of the 2011 Japanese earthquake and tsunami. And there were numerous magnitude six earthquakes across the globe, including a well-known one in Croatia. Uh, oh no, this one's in Greece, excuse me. There was a magnitude 6.3 in Greece that damaged many buildings and caused numerous injuries. Uh, I haven't found any reports of death. Uh, there was another one of similar size in Algeria. 
we go. And moving, zooming into the United States here, uh, this is all of the earthquakes since January 30th above magnitude 2.5. Uh, you can see activity here in the Walker Lane and in the northern San Andreas zone. Uh, normal background activity. These are all primarily aftershocks from the uh, Monte Cristo earthquake and Ridgecrest earthquakes, both in 2019. Uh, there are some interesting swarms over here in Texas. This is a gas field, so it's probably related to not fracking. It's not related to fracking. It is related instead to deep disposal wells, which are injecting fluid into depths in the crust where earthquakes can generate because fracking happens at too shallow of an area for earthquakes to generate. And similar earthquakes across Oklahoma here, uh, not quite near the major fault, the Mears fault that runs through Oklahoma, but close enough to be interesting from a seismological perspective. And we had an interesting event in Iceland that began uh, about a month and a half ago. They started detecting small earthquakes in seismicity in the uh, southwestern, uh, what's the peninsula called? The, the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland, uh, which hasn't had a volcanic eruption in about 800 years. And there was an, a, a good sized earthquake magnitude 5.7 uh, in the 24th of February. And since then they've detected a high number of earthquakes and seismicity going on in this area, some unusual geothermal activity. So the Meteorological Society, the Meteorological Survey of Iceland uh, put out press releases saying we expect a volcanic eruption here in the future. And this is our segue to the volcanoes segment of this presentation in which there was a volcanic eruption in Iceland. A small dike intrusion reached the surface and began a volcanic eruption in Iceland in an area that had not seen an eruption for about 800 years. The volcanic edifice uh, has not seen an eruption in about 6,000 years. Um, so this uh, is being considered new activity on Fagra Dalsfjall. I'm sure Scott Burns can give me a better pronunciation on that when we're done here. Uh, but we've got several nice spatter cones and an effusive Hawaiian style basalt flow, uh, which means that it's gentle, um, sort of steadily flowing lava. Uh, we have Preliminary geochemistry results from this lava, which tell us it is coming straight up from the mantle. Um, and that's obviously very large magma source down in the mantle. So this eruption could continue for a very long time. Quite beautiful. Um, people have been getting close to this eruption. Uh, as you can see from this picture, there's a little bit of trickery going on. There's uh, some telephoto lens uh, exaggeration effects going here. They're probably about a kilometer away from the actual vent itself. Um, but you can walk right up to these lava flows with a fair degree of safety. I'm not sure I would. There have been videos circulating on Twitter from the volcanologists uh, grilling hot dogs and boiling tea on the lava flow. So this is sort of a fun tourist event as well as being scientifically interesting. Moving on to the rest of the globe, uh, Kilauea and Etna are both still erupting as they were in February. There are currently 38 ongoing or new eruptions. Uh, and there's an interesting earthquake swarm within the actual mountain above ground edifice of Mauna Loa uh, in, the rift, in the east rift zone, suggesting that some magma is beginning to move upward into the mountain. Uh, we've been detecting ongoing inflation within the mountain of the shallow magma chamber about since the eruption ended in 1983 there. And additionally, the lava dome at La Soufriere in St. Vincent it has been growing at a little bit rapid, uh, a more rapid pace than it was before. Um, when it just started, it was a, a cute little round circle in the bottom of the crater here, and now it is filling a substantial portion of the caldera at the volcano. And this is on the island of St. Vincent in the Caribbean. And move on to some new research now. This was uh, an exciting time for new research. Uh, the Perseverance rover on Mars, which landed back in February, is finally getting to work and we've been targeting uh, some rocks along the way. And this first rock is called Maz, and that's Navajo for Mars. A lot of the new features um, that Perseverance rover is uh, discovering and identifying are being uh, named after Navajo words, and that's just uh, a choice they made to collaborate with the Navajo Nation on naming features on Mars. Um, we don't have full science results from this rock yet, but we expect it to be mafic in composition. So that's a basalt, which we have lots of around here. And it's either going to be a solid uh, piece of basalt, lava flow, or it's going to be uh, basaltic sediment cemented together. I'm leaning more towards the solid piece of basalt interpretation of this, but we'll find out probably in a couple of weeks. 
oh, and the button didn't show up. But what you're hearing now, um, you can't hear it because I haven't enabled sound. There it is. Go back. No. Uh oh. Sounds on Mars have been recorded. You should be able to hear it. It's very quiet wind noise. There we go. Yeah, they really put a should have put a windsock on that mic. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. And that is the sound of the wind on Mars. There were other sound recordings like the metal wheels reaching over rocks and the noisy articulated joints of the rover, but that wasn't quite as great as a listening experience, so I opted not to include those. And there's an interesting new paper put out that talked about the boring billion, which was a, a time in Earth's period that I wasn't familiar with until I read this paper. Uh, and this occurred about 1.8 billion years ago to about 800 million years ago. Now, I abbreviated that as years before present here. Um, so in this time, we had a supercontinent called uh, Rodinia. And this paper seemed to identify why this sort of period in time was so quiet for life evolution and some other things. And they discovered that supercontinent formation led to fewer mountains and thinning crust. So when the supercontinent comes together with all these little continent pieces collide, that's creating a lot of mountain ranges, but they're all stuck together. So there's not really new mountain ranges getting created. And so they're all eroding. These continents are eroding uh, over time. Uh, and since they're not, there's not a lot of movement going on, new mountains aren't being uplifted. So the crust is thinning. And since very little mountain building was going on and there was high erosion, the continents got thinned out and flattened out and all of the sediments got stuck in the ocean. And there wasn't, there was a very long period of time when because of the low erosion, low mountain building that uh, there wasn't a lot of sediment and nutrients being added into the ocean. So even though life, eukaryotes and bacteria started to evolve around 1.7 billion years ago, uh, we didn't see great diversification until about 800 million years ago. And that's getting closer to the Cambrian explosion there. Um, I'm not remembering the exact hundreds millions of years when the Cambrian period began, because it's been a few years since historical geology. Um, but these researchers, uh, Ming, Chu, Zhu, uh, Jigua, Shen, and Bing uh, put out an interesting new paper that identified uh, the lack of topography and uh, mountain building to be an interesting reason why life took a long period of very little evolution. Another new interesting paper was put out regarding the creation of the moon. Uh, so we've known for, we've thought for a very long time that the moon was created by an impact between the early earth and another protoplanet called Theia about four and a half billion years ago, uh, these two bodies collided. And seismic wave surveys have also long revealed two large blobs deep in the interior of the Earth. And these are uh, high velocity zones of very co of comparatively cold, but very dense rock. And they're kind of on either sides of the Earth underneath the South Pacific and underneath Iceland. Uh, and so seismologists and uh, deep Earth sort of researchers have been puzzling about why these two blobs were there. Um, but recent uh, isotope analyses, uh, geochemistry analyses from lavas in Iceland and from Samoa have suggested that uh, these are highly, highly primitive zones in the mantle, suggesting um, that they're exactly about the right composition, uh, temperature, size, uh, to be remains of a protoplanet, very early, very little, uh, very, you know, very primitive, uh, not very evolved rocks. And so in addition to the seismic wave surveys, we've interpreted that this is actual chunks of Theia's mantle or core that are stuck into the deep interior of the earth. Wow. That I, that, well, this is, I, I've got to interrupt because I didn't know about these blobs. I, I don't know if other people did, but I was wondering, is there any surface expression of those blobs or is this something that we just detect with seismic waves that these, these it, chunks these are, are down there? These are just detected with seismic waves. Okay. Uh, here's a little animation of that collision. This is the L4 Lagrange point, which is a gravitational point in our orbit, which Theia was locked at until Venus changed in its orbit 
and that knocked Thea out of the Lagrange point, uh, becoming unstable and hurtling towards Earth, colliding. You can see here the core of Thea melts and joins Earth. A, mater a ring of material began to orbit Earth, uh, which either rejoined the planet or accreted into the moon. There you go. How nice. And so they were able to determine um, that the volcanoes above these blobs deep within the Earth um, are highly primitive, suggesting a protoplanetary origin. And that's getting into deep chemistry with meteorites and other weird stuff that I don't really know very much about. And staying on that theme of geochemistry that I don't know very much about, we finally have evidence for uh, Earth's molten oceans. So in the earliest Archaean Hadean days of the, of the planet's existence, that was obviously very hot from all of the solid material and solar system accreting to form the planet. Uh, this is going back four and a half billion years. And we've always thought that the planet was molten rock for a very long time, but we didn't really have any evidence for it. Uh, but some new researchers, uh, there are not new researchers, but these researchers put out new research about 3.7 billion year old rocks from Greenland, the Isua supercrustal belt. Uh, these are basalts. And they did an iron isotope analysis. This is iron 57 they're using to trace the differentiation from crystals from liquid. So you got melt here, uh, crystals form, and then they settle down. And this is called accumulate down here. And over time, the heat flow changes and that causes melting of the crystals. Uh, you get more melt, it gets extracted, and then you get more recrystallization. And this is how magmas and rocks evolve over time. Crystals forming, melt being extracted. And this is the earliest evidence of magma oceans, even though they certainly existed long before that. And these are some of the diagrams they used. Uh, these are trace elements, uh, LU and hafnium. And this is zircon and neodymium. And the, the fractions between uh, the ratios between these elements are used to sort of plot changes in geochemistry over time. I'm going to move on back to earthquakes. Uh, there's a great new paper put out from Caltech that sought to uh, study the relationship between heat and earthquake ruptures on large faults like the San Andreas. Uh, so they measured very low background heat generated from tectonic friction. This is the Pacific plate and the North American plate colliding. So we expect there to be a lot of friction in that process and a lot of background high heat flow. Um, however, it was a lot lower than they expected in their research. So there's kind of two hypotheses for how great earthquakes, you know, in magnitude seven, upper seven range uh, behave. And that's that Either a fault becomes dynamically weak during the earthquake rupture, rupture uh, because groundwater and other fluids along the fault vaporize, which makes the frictional contact between the two sides of the fault weaker, uh, which makes it slip more and sort of being a positive feedback loop and that makes a much bigger earthquake. Or faults are always weak because there's always fluids there and that means that an earthquake will be big no matter what and there's no dynamic stress in there. Um, I'm sort of on the fence between which two I like, which model I like better. I need to study more about that, especially since I'm studying earthquakes. Um, but the findings from this paper about low background heat uh, will improve future models of the San Andreas's behavior. So that's very interesting. A little bit technical. I don't want to get into it too far because it's quite technical. This is one um, was very interesting to me. I'm a big fan of geysers and we got a great new imaging of the plumbing below Steamboat Geyser in Yellowstone, which is the largest geyser in the world. Uh, Steamboat Geyser is the one marked by the star here. These are uh, measurements in meters. So seismic waves uh, generated by the geyser erupting um, created seismic waves that were measured by all of these little triangles are uh, seismometers, effectively seismic nodes, we call them. Um, and Steamboat Geyser has been way more active and generating a lot more eruptions in the last three years than I think in the last century before that that's been recorded. So this gives us an excellent opportunity to map the plumbing system. Uh, and these two, uh, there's a spring next to it called Cistern Spring, and these two features sort of interact between eruptions. Um, Cistern Spring will frequently empty after a Steamboat Geyser eruption. And so we thought they were directly connected but the mapping we were able to do from the uh, seismic station showed us that they are not in fact connected. So we think that there's probably fractures or porous rocks, something that we can't really see on 
uh, on this kind of seismic survey to uh, show the connection between the two. This has also been done on Old Faithful and a couple of other famous geysers in Yellowstone, but this is the clearest, most high resolution picture ever produced for one of these features, as far as I'm aware. As someone who is also studying glaciers as part of my master's research, um, I was very excited to come across this paper on Ethiopian glaciers. Uh, Ethiopia, obviously Central Africa, uh, we don't think of a lot of glaciers there. But the Ethiopian highlands are at 4,000 meters. And during the last uh, cooling period, the last ice age and all of that, uh, the tropics were cooled around about 115,000 years ago, they reached their coldest period. Um, so there's no glaciers in Ethiopia now, despite very high altitude, that's you know 12 to 13,000 feet. Um, and these glacial deposits have showed that glaciers existed in the Pleistocene in the Ice Age that reached maximums 30 to 40,000 years ago. And so this suggests a tropical, a cooling of the tropics in Africa of four to six degrees Celsius in the last Ice Age, uh, but this is non-uniform and other high areas in Africa don't necessarily show glacial features that correlate with this. I really liked these pictures of the uh, glacial features here. Uh, these arrows show direction of glacier flow. Uh, so you've got two glaciers merging here, but been flowing this way. Nice U-shaped valleys uh, as a lateral moraine right here. Uh, that might be a terminal moraine. Yeah, these are lateral moraines. These are all glacial depositional features. Another interesting piece of research came coming out of the Southern Hemisphere where uh, the geothermal heat, uh, the heat flow below Antarctica has been mapped for the first time. Really, it's been modeled. We can't quite measure the heat flow in Antarctica like we can here because there's many kilometers of ice covering Antarctica. Antarctica is covered in a thick ice sheet. Uh, in North America, for example, we measure heat flow by these boreholes and we simply put thermometers down the holes and we figure out, we measure how hot the rock is at depth. And we can't do that in Antarctica because it's prohibitively expensive and there's environmental concerns. Uh, it's a very sensitive and expensive environment to do research in. So the next best thing is we model it. And we measured, uh, we, we know we can estimate the temperature of the rock at the base of the ice cap. Um, based on the rate the glacier's moving, melting, we can measure that pretty easily. Um, but there's also things we have to take into account, like when the glacier moves, it generates friction and heats up the rock, but we can account for that. Uh, so that was sort of one angle we used to estimate this, uh, but we also used the known modeling inside the earth that we've established from seismic waves, uh, which has been done for about 120 years now. We have a very good idea what the inside of the earth looks like. And we used that knowledge of the earth's interior to estimate heat flow and heat production of, from the mantle. And we make assumptions about the basement rock and the structure inside Antarctica. There's some tectonic straining and other weird stuff that can generate heat. Uh, but this model showed that there's very high, very high heat flow in some areas like out here in the Antarctic Peninsula uh, and very low uh, heat flow uh, here in central Antarctica suggesting to me that this is a very old, very stable piece of crust right here. Someone is and, asking you, what are the units on the model? Oh, this is watts per meters squared. Okay. Good Millo question. Milliwatts? Yeah, milliwatts per meters squared. That's how we measure heat flow. Are there any other questions before I, 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 get, I I'll get to Shake Alert and then I'll cover questions. So we got Shake Alert in Oregon. California's had it for a while. Washington has had it about a month now. And we got Shake Alert about two weeks ago on March, what was that, March 11th? Uh, on the anniversary of the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. And that gives us alerts seconds to minutes before shaking begins. Um, if you're on an iPhone, it would look exactly like this. It's not something you have to install. This is a, um, a statewide program uh, that every phone will get an alert like this um, in the event of an earthquake. And when an earthquake happens, you get two kinds of waves. You get a P wave and an S wave. The P wave travels faster. And the time between the arrival of the P wave and the S wave um, is the time between earthquake is detected and when the shaking starts. An S wave generates most of the shaking. So there's a time difference between those two. When a P wave is detected, you get, uh, you get a warning, which will give you seconds uh, and maybe a minute for a very far away, very large earthquake to drop cover, hold on and protect yourself in the event of a major earthquake. 
And that's all I have for you this month. I will see you next week on next month on the geology news. And I'm Andrew. happy to take any questions. Andrew, I, I think we'll hold questions until the at top of the hour. But oh, I, yeah. I love, love the the comprehensiveness of both the volcano and earthquake report and the uh, and the latest research. That's fascinating and a lot of stuff that I hadn't seen come over my transom. So really appreciate that. And Andrew also does wonderful videos. And Andrew, what's your what's your YouTube channel? It is called Better Geology. Better Geology, and it's interesting because uh, a lot of us and Andrew, you've in, you've inspired me. Uh, a lot of us have in the past year found ourselves focusing a lot more on video uh, production and audio production and so forth. And even this meetup, we're kind of drawing from a tradition of. Uh, you know, talk shows and podcasts like This Week in Tech or uh, the Weekly Space Hangout. And um, of, among that, of that, I think audio is maybe the most important. And also the of, of that, the most important is the conversation between people. So one of the reasons I invited Shannon Doolin and John Lehman today is because their podcast, uh, the Don't Panic Geocast, is just a great example of that kind of conversation and how one can get drawn in to especially a conversation between old friends. So when you, you tune into that podcast, listen to me, I'm still saying tune in, uh, you might hear John ask Shannon, well, how is your week? And you might hear something about hailstorms or field camp or, or grading, but that will quickly, uh, quickly move into a conversation about uh, uh, different types of uh, uh, sedimentary classification or uh, geomagnetism or uh, uh, porosity and so forth. And then it ends with something that I'll let them explain called Fun Paper Friday. So uh, Shannon and John, could you introduce yourselves and uh, let's, let's hear about your podcast. Go for it, John. All right, so uh, hi everybody, my name's John Lehman. Uh, I'm a rock friction and fault mechanics person by training. So I started at the University of Oklahoma as a meteorology major and decided that one degree with a lot of math wasn't enough. So I got a geophysics degree there as well, and then went on to Penn State to do my PhD in Chris Marone's rock mechanics lab. I've always done a lot of uh, experimental work and hands-on work, also a lot of work that involves computers. That comes out, I think, in our discussions in the show. And I've known Shannon I think we're going to get into this uh, based on what some of the things went to Paul wanted to talk about. I've known Shannon for, I would say, we're coming up on 10 years now. Well, so how did you two decide to do a podcast? <laughs> where, did that, where did that come out of your out of the conversations that you were having? And Shannon, tell us what your, what your day job is. So um, I'm a professor here at the University of Oklahoma. Um, I also got my undergrad degree in meteorology and geology a long time ago when I went and worked um, for a while and came back to get my PhD. And so that's where I met John is when I started um, back from a PhD in 2010. I took a um, geophysics field methods course and we were in that together. And it took a while, but you know, there weren't very many people in that class. And so we got to know each other through that. And since he and I are the only two people who've ever gotten meteorology and geology degrees, from OU, um, obviously we had to become friends. It wasn't a choice. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's not, I mean, that's one of the things I love about the podcast is that you you do talk about geosciences more broadly. Uh, and so is that not common that people combine meteorology and geology? No, um, for the reasons that John said, uh, we actually have a, so I started meteorology right after the movie Twister came out and there were uh -huh. 260 freshmen and I graduated 39 of us. So, um, because it's so math intensive, um, people don't really know what they're getting into, um, especially in Oklahoma, you know, it's tornadoes all the time, everyone's real into it, but the work is quite hard. So um, a lot of people don't necessarily go down that, but I think we'll also get into this. The physics are really similar between the two fields. So it's not really scientifically that big of a stretch. Um, we actually have two other geology meteorology majors right now that are undergrads here at OU. So I'm pretty oh, excited really? about that. Can I, I have never been clear, what is the difference between a geologist and a geophysicist? And I also apologize, both of you are doctors Doolin and Lehman, and I should have said that up front. What, okay. So what is, how is geophysics uh, different as a, as a field from geology per se? 
Well, so my opinion is, is the geophysicists, we're more about using sensing methods to determine what's going on underneath the surface, what we can't see. Whereas the geologists, in my mind, are the ones that are looking at the surface and making interpretations of what's going on underneath, looking at more of the history, how did it get there, how did it become this way, whereas most geophysicists are really employed in trying to understand what's there right now and how can we sense it, what can we learn about those properties without actually having to go get hands-on with those rocks. Uh, so you know, it's common to use methods like seismology or ground penetrating radar, uh, some of the more common ones, of course, they're gravity and magnetics. So those are the tools that geophysicists more typically employ. Uh, you know, and there's always the, the joke of, to a geophysicist, you know, there's red rock and black rock and tan rock. We don't really deal with things like the sedimentary <laughs> classification so much. Uh, whereas Shannon can probably give you a, a much better description from a geologist view of how, how we're a little different. And that would be my layman's terms is that John doesn't like to touch rocks and I do. <laughs> <laughs> So how did you decide between geology and, and meteorology? Uh, for me, it was, I worked at the National Sphere Storms Lab. I drove around those cars that have all the stuff on top of it and got to do a bunch of really great stuff. And it was the same week in my undergrad that I got offered a master's, like a funding for a master's in geology or funding for a master's in meteorology. And it was like the worst week of my life because I had to just decide the rest of my life right then. Um, but I decided that I didn't want to be behind a computer all the time. And so that is basically why I chose geology in the end. And John? So I was, as an undergrad, really interested in doing research. So I'd actually published uh, a paper looking at electro electromagnetic signatures around thunderstorms uh, pretty early on in that. And at least at that time, it was really hard for undergrads to get involved with uh, field meteorology research. Uh, the culture in that field has changed quite a bit in the last few years, I would say. But at that time, it wasn't something that you really did as an undergrad. And I had taken a geology class. I was interested in geology and geophysics. And uh, during that class, uh, the professor said, oh, I work on these things called hydrates. And I knew some things about hydrates and uh, talked with her after class. And she said, well, I need somebody to work in my lab. Is this something you want to do? Said, of, of course. Uh, mm -hmm. So really, it was the, the opening of these arms up to an undergrad of yes, you know, come in, work with us, do research that got me into the field. And then I realized that I could do a lot of the things I liked about meteorology uh, in a geology context or in a general or science context, even uh, because we've done some things looking at how meteorological events can produce signals on seismic arrays and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so really it was just the opportunity opened itself at the right time to pursue that as a career choice. We have some people here who are headed toward research and then some of us who are in our point in our lives where we, we don't have to think about our career choices coming up. What was it like to go into research for each of you and what, what did you, I know you now have both sort of slightly different roles, but what was it, uh, what do you remember most fondly about your, your research or? I, I think, and I asked this, of, we've had three faculty candidates in in the last week and I asked this because it was such a big deal for me to be involved in undergraduate research. I started working at the Severe Storms Laboratory after um, my freshman year and so I know I was fairly aggressive because I knew it's what I wanted to do and trying to get out there and I worked both there and in a paleomagnetics lab so I did geology research and meteorology research. As an undergrad I got to go to Scotland and work on geology like magnetics in, in Scotland and so um, I think undergraduates Wow. professors that allow undergraduates to work in their labs like they make the difference in people's lives because I didn't really know what I wanted to do but this is how I got to where I am today and I'm I'm more of a teaching professor than a research professor but I still have a research program and I still have you know um, graduate students and everything as well although my uh, other job is being the director of our field camp so that takes up a lot of time too. So can, you mentioned paleomag, I think, and could you explain what that is? And is it really, really easy to do? No. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, so what I do is I go out into the world and I take this chainsaw. It's super fun and it's modified <laughs> to have a coring device on it. And I wind up coring little rocks that look like this. So oh. I've got a little core here. That's what they look like. Yep. Okay. And so we orient them in the field. Here's my orientation mark on here. And we go back and we stick them in a magnetometer and all that does, all that does, I mean, it's 
quite complicated, <laughs> but um, what it does is it looks at the magnetization that's inside these little rocks. And so when rocks form, they can get magnetizations or when something happens to them later in their lives, they can get magnetizations. And what I'm looking for is what are the age of those magnetizations? Based on a, an existing chronology that we have of, of the reversals that um, that's one way that we can do it. Um, okay. Yeah. And then just the directions of the magnetic field as the, and so this was something that Andrew talked about. So as continents move, um, the rocks are constantly acquiring Earth's magnetic field at that time. So we can actually work out the geometries of where the continents were. And paleomagnetism is how we did that in the first place. So what is that like when you get it into the lab? And, and tell me again, maybe you said it, but how do you preserve the orientation of the, the sample Oh, um, so if you're looking at just, if you walked up to any rock outcrop, right, we take this chainsaw and we just drill straight into it. And mm -hmm. so this little, this has been cut, but it comes out a cord, it's usually about this long. Um, and we have a compass on a stick that we stick down there and then uh -huh. we mark, we wind up making that mark on it <laughs> based on that compass reading. So that's how we orient them. I see, the I see. Yeah. And John's had to, this is, endeavor is not, um, it takes a lot of upfront work because you don't know until you get back to the lab and you've cut everything if there's actually magnetization in the rocks. Not all rocks have a magnetization. And I've made John carry lots of water and field equipment for me. On well, one of my early things. field experiences was carrying five gallon jugs of water to lubricate this chainsaw uh, up some very, <laughs> very steep slopes out in Colorado. Yes. That's one thing I love about geology is the combination of the high tech and low tech for, for the research. So low tech. Uh -huh. <laughs> How we get these out? Like we literally we have a rock and it's called the beating rock, and you just stick a like you stick a a screwdriver and you whack that rock on it and it pops these cores right out of the rocks that they're in. So and then when tech. you when you get it back to the lab, what do you? It's really boring. Um, like looking at the lab is really boring because everything just takes place inside this big metal tube. And um, the process is magnetization is a vector. So if like this pencil with the arrow here, um, over time, we have to heat it up and then measure it, heat it up and then measure it. As we do that, we, we reveal this direction. And that's, the, that's where we match it up to our known directions of Earth's magnetic field. And we can tell the timing. You, you heat it up and measure it. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And I just uh, am going to put in the, the chat. Uh, I've got a, some pictures actually on our website, uh, on my company's website of paleomagnetic labs. So you can see what it looks like inside these magnetically shielded rooms that Shannon gets to spend a lot of time in. <laughs> it's very boring. Uh, yeah. So John designed a lot of our equipment. There's not a lot of paleomagnetists out there. Um, there are I don't know, 10 to 15 labs in the US maybe is all. Um, mm -hmm. And so John has come in and designed a bunch of equipment for us for our A-Lane 30-year-old magnetometer. So. Uh -huh. That's one of the conversations that I, I always, I, I, I love hearing John discuss and uh, uh, that sort of bridge between the instrumentation and the engineering side. So John, how did you get into, how did you go from research to uh, working on instrumentation? <laughs> Uh, well, so I've always, you know, like I said, when I was an undergrad, I was working in a lab and the first, one of the first tasks there was we need this little hydrate reactor. We need something to be able to measure temperature and pressure. So can you figure out how to do that? Well, sure. I'm, I like electronics. I like doing mechanics and learned about the basic instrumentation to do that. And then uh, in grad school, spent a lot of time trying to determine really very small movements on laboratory faults. So, you know, these faults that Andrew was reporting on are, are huge kilometer scale things. My fault was a hundred millimeters by a hundred millimeters in the lab. So <laughs> I was doing very tiny uh, measurements of magnitude minus four, minus five earthquakes. So there's a lot of designing uh, the actual hardware to do that and working on the sensors and systems to be able to resolve that. And I, I really enjoyed that. And so what ended up happening was towards the end of grad school, uh, I made uh, what I call my crazy wall of all these post-it notes of, okay, I can go and do research or I can go and, uh, you know, work, work for the man, whoever the man is uh, in, in corporate life, or I can uh, start doing uh, things with my own company. And it ultimately decided that doing instrumentation to solve those problems for scientists was what I wanted to do. 
Uh, though I enjoyed the research, I really enjoyed the technical challenge uh, of solving those problems that they just thought were pesky. You know, they wanted to get to the science, do these experiments. Uh, and I really enjoyed the engineering that bridged that and heard lots of complaints of, you know, we hired an engineering firm to do this and they don't understand how research works. We don't know all the numbers. We don't know exactly what we need to do. Uh, so that's the, the bridge that I endeavored to make. And that's what I get to do for a day job now is measure things that people want to measure that have, haven't been measured before generally. And your, your day job, again, if, if you didn't say it already, is, is called? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, I, I run a company called Lehman Geophysical. Uh, we're a small uh, custom instrumentation and consulting firm, uh, now based in Northwest Arkansas. And I'm actually sitting in our shop right now, but thanks to this virtual background, you don't get to, to see a lot <laughs> of what's going on. Uh, but we've, we do uh, beginning to end design work. So if somebody comes and says, I, I wanna do this experiment, uh, we help them design the equipment to do it. Uh, we've got a full machine shop and machinist that actually manufactures this. Uh, we've got uh, a group, uh, our couple of folks that do, for example, these are, well, if it's going <laughs> to background might cut me bit. off there. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. Um, so we design and manufacture our own circuit boards for whatever application oh. they need, uh, do all the programming for that, uh, calibrate the instrument and then deliver it. So we're a full manufacturing facility. Wow. And this is so important to like the sciences because just like John said, engineering and sciences aren't necessarily the same thing. And so, you know, I had a science question, you know, this thing is broken, but you, John knew, you know, how to make a magnetometer. So he knew exactly like what needed to be done, which if you worked with an engineering firm, it'd be 900 times as long, 900 times as expensive because they'd mm -hmm. have to learn all that stuff too. So, um, it, and this is why John doesn't sleep basically <laughs> because like that's that's a really unique thing and I think it's really important for like people to realize that you can take these different paths to get here and like that right. that's a very important place you know to support other scientists. I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by the way science leaps in progression with advances in instrumentation and I mean, some of the stuff we're seeing out of seismic tomography really seems to be the sort of leading edge. Are, are there areas, John, in the instrumentation that you work on that you feel you're really excited about? You see it's progressing uh, a lot in the next in the next decade. Oh, for sure. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with light. Uh, so hmm. fiber optic sensing is becoming a very big thing. It's it's been around since I would say the early 2000s. Uh, this idea that you can use fiber optic cables and their properties and properties of light uh, to do some really incredible sensing jobs. And now it's just getting very good, but we're not, we're not too great yet. Uh, one of the coolest uh, demos of this that I've seen was there was some uh, abandoned fiber cable on a university campus. It was just in a you know communications tunnel, just laid out in the tunnel uh, and using uh, some interferometers where you sweep through a frequency uh, range of light and look at the reflections from that light due to small imperfections in the cable you actually ended up making a distributed seismic array and you oh. can see teleseismic rays coming across our teleseismic waves coming across this, uh, this array made by this cable. Uh, there's also some really cool work being done. You know, when we think of seismology, we generally think of measuring accelerations or maybe velocities, generally mm -hmm. not position. Uh, but we're, we're measuring that component, but there's a whole nother component that- You're, you're uh, measuring position, did you say, or, or? So you're generally measuring an acceleration or a velocity, okay. and then uh -huh. we're integrating that to get uh, position. Uh, since measuring position at these low frequencies is a little bit trickier business, because uh, you know, you've got to say teleseismic surface waves are coming across you, they're 20 second period or something like that, very long, long period waves. Uh, but by having a network of these seismometers, we can go ahead and back out basically the full state of the rock. You know, the, what's mm -hmm. the, what's the strain tensor look like, mm -hmm. but with, uh, with some of the new advances in fiber, we're starting to be able to sense rotation. So not only acceleration in each axis, but rotation about each axis and make six component seismometers. So X, Y, and Z acceleration or velocity and X, Y, and Z rotation. Now you've got one six component station that can, take the place of several sensors in an array telling you more about the, the full straight of stain state of strain in the rock uh, and doing that with light is just incredible right now it's these you know kind of two three foot in diameter loops and you're sending light 
around the loop, miles and miles of fiber in one direction, miles and miles of fiber in the other, and you're interfering them at the end. Oh. And if you're rotating that loop, well, relatively the speed is different. And so you get an interference pattern from that. Wow. Uh, hopefully our sensing technology is going to get better over the next few years. Mm -hmm. Fibers going far ahead. It's being advanced by not seismology, but communications and data traffic uh, to get those down to where, you know, maybe in 10 or 20 years, uh, we've got something the size of this coffee cup that uh, is a full six component station. Wow. That's amazing. So at what point in your, in your friendship or your working together, did you say this, what, what we're doing here would make a good podcast? And how did you, how, how did you get to that point? Shannon, do you want to take that one? <laughs> so we used to hang out at a bar in downtown Norman. <laughs> okay, so that's the starting point. <laughs> and yeah, so RIP McNally's, it's not a wrap. And I got to interrupt, but... why are you in Norman in the first place? What, or did you well, say that? Or... Well, that's that's where we went to school. So okay. that's where the University of Oklahoma is. All right. Yeah, so, so when I had come back and we eventually started, you know, talking to each other and we're like, oh, we have a lot in common or whatever. We'd go to this bar because we also had in common the fact that we love beer because we're geologists. And, uh, <laughs> and so we'd go there and we would just talk about nerdy stuff, man. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's sometimes hard. Um, I mean, the school of meteorology here is pretty intense. Like the competition is very intense. There are a lot of really intense people in meteorology, uh, geology less so, but also, you know, we were competitive nerds and we like to talk about nerdy stuff. And then when John left to go to get his PhD, we didn't get to meet or hang out so much. And, you know, we still wanted to talk about science stuff. And I think it was your idea, John, that we start, start a podcast because surely people would find what we talked about interesting. Yes, right? yes. <laughs> Yeah. And there wasn't so, a lot out there, you know, we yeah. both listened to podcasts and there wasn't a lot out there in geology podcasts at the time mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There was a big yeah, gap for a while there. Mm -hmm. so and then don't did... panic comes from I was gonna ask. galaxy. <laughs> okay. So explain that. What, what is, what is that sort of theme of don't panic? It's, uh, and, and then the, <laughs> it's, the it's tagline. Exact science. <laughs> so that is our tagline. And um, that's really something that's very funny to people because in geology, it's not an exact science. And that really frustrates some more engineeringly minded people. So John and I would fight about that a lot because he wanted exact answers and, I see. and there aren't sometimes. Hmm. <laughs> um, and so Don't Panic comes from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, the Douglas Adams books where the Don't Panic was on the cover of the guide the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So that's of course, for people who know that cultural reference. So is it really a, a, a an advice to people who are approaching geology or are in geology or geoengineering as a profession to not, but what you're describing to me sounds pretty precise, actually the instrumentation, but. Oh, well, that's, that's John's part. That's, that's John's part. part. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what, how much present, how much preparation do you, you, uh, you're, you're, you're having your podcast once a week on the average and how much preparation actually goes into it. And I want to ask you about your audio equipment, but I'll save that. I don't want to lose my audience. So I'm going to save that for, for a little later. How so much preparation? We're six, six years in John. Yeah. Something like that now. Yeah. So we're six years in and I remember fighting in the beginning. I'm like, no, let's do this once a month. And John was like, no, once a week. I'm like, Oh, uh -huh. good Lord. <laughs> But it's it's totally the way to keep a podcast audience too is to always you know come out with material um, at the same time. And at first we would practice. We have a shared Google Doc where we put our notes and our mm -hmm. ideas, and we'd practice together and do all this stuff. And then we finally decided that that was sort of antithetical to what we wanted to do, which was just meet and have you know chicken wings and a beer and talk about geology. So <laughs> we started to relax a lot more. And so our um, prep and some prep is harder than others, depending on what the subject is and how much we know about it. Um, but it's definitely less than a lot of our other podcaster friends do. Yeah, I would say we spend, you know, if it's a topic that we're very familiar with, we may not have to spend that long at all. We, of course, mm -hmm. prep for the fun paper segment and we'll put some notes together just to sort of guide the conversation so we don't have too many dead spots. Uh, but if it's something that neither of us are very familiar with, uh, some of my favorite shows that we did were relatively early on uh, were the shows on time. I think it's mm. two episodes mm. on how time, how we keep time, how all the different time standards, you know, some of them are 13 seconds different. That drives somebody like me that deals with <laughs> sub second data. Absolutely insane. Uh, 
so how does that all work? I, I probably spent 20 hours on those two <laughs> shows learning about all these different time standards. So that, yeah, it really varies. Uh huh. Well, that's one of the things that's the most delightful about uh, about podcasts in general. And I can't tell you how many household tasks, uh, laundry, dishes, gardening, uh, ha your voices have accompanied me. And I think one of the <laughs> things that is most appealing is is the freshness of that conversation, and that you're both, you know, you you you're both interested in what the other person has to say. I think that's one of the things that really sort of definitely uh, draws me into that. Um, I'm, I'm glad you say that because there are yeah. definitely times that we're talking about geology and I can tell John is asleep and he doesn't care. <laughs> oh. So I'm glad that we faked you out. <laughs> well, he, yeah, he does a good job of faking that, faking that interest. And uh, so I appreciate that. Now, Shannon, you're teaching. Do you want to say a little bit about what that, that sort of bridging that world between research and teaching and especially what that's been like in the past year or when everything has been virtual oh, or yeah, it's been maybe terrible. not everything? Um, <laughs> so here in Oklahoma, we, um, last year we went, you know, virtual for the rest of the semester, but starting in the fall, we were in person under a certain number of students. So most of my classes were in person, but I'm also the director of our field camp. So if you're a geology undergrad major, almost anywhere, you have to go in the summertime and take six hours of geology courses, which in our case, we have a geology field station in Canyon city, Colorado. So it's right outside of, um, if you're familiar with Pueblo, it's just west of Pueblo. If you're familiar with Colorado Springs, it's just southwest of Colorado Springs, about 60 miles. And so we have a station out there where everybody goes and we stay there for six weeks. We also run a geophysics field camp there as well. Um, and so we haven't been able to do that. I just found out yesterday that we're not gonna be able to do it again this summer. So that's unfortunate. So we had to take field geology and teach it mm -hmm. online. I see. What was that like? <laughs> <laughs> it was very hard. Um, so it was really what Zoom made possible, though, is that we had a big group of field camp directors like myself and field camp instructors that got together from around the world. And we started immediately. So in March, we started having um, meetings and then we all started producing and um, also just creating online content that could be used for a six week geology field camp. Um, so a lot of Google Earth, mm -hmm. um, some GIS, which you know some people have more GIS required in their curriculum than others. And we don't have much, so I'm not super into that, but we did a lot of Google Earth. Like what we did is I took my TAs and we went out to Canyon City and we filmed a whole bunch of stuff right. and had online mapping exercises. And while it was not ideal, you know, you want students to be out to see geology. Um, I actually think in terms of the skills they learned, it was quite good because that's what you're mm -hmm. going to do as a geologist is you're going to sit down in front of a computer and you're going to have right. to come up with data. So where right. do you find it? What mm -hmm. do you do? And I don't think we ever teach students that. And so they actually learned that skill of, oh, I can go to Google Earth Web. I can go to these other places and get the data that I need. So that's what we did. It was really hard. Uh -huh. <laughs> I talked about it a lot on the podcast because it was traumatic <laughs> but right. I think it worked out as well as it could so I think this is something that a lot of us uh, the geological society offers field trips and we've been trying to figure out how to virtualize some of those experiences we put 60 years of our field trip guides on our website and I made my first partly Shannon with the influence of the videos that you did on yours and also Andrew has done some of these Google Maps as well and Sheila, our former president who's here has done some of those videos. It's a lot of work to create that video content, but it does mm -hmm. seem like it's worth it. And it does seem like uh, it, learning those skills. And I've, this year I've had to really focus on, you know, video editing and, you know, just getting good, good camera shots out there. And yes, because you know, there are so. some, if you don't have a, you know, a, a gyroscope to keep your camera still like you can't watch some of these online videos yeah that made. like they literally make you sick <laughs> so yeah, absolutely there was a lot of that, that I, I have learned that I need to put even though uh, iPhone has image stabilization I need to put the phone on a tripod when I get mm -hmm. my yeah I get my so I'm going to ask you real quickly two questions and then I Carol I think we're going to go maybe two minutes past the hour um the one question is uh, what's what's your audio <laughs> what's your audio setup <laughs> this is more for John's me than anyone else. fancier than mine. Okay. Um, I just have a Rode Podcaster mic. 
Um, okay. And then, you know, some fancy Sony headphones is all I use, but he's got a full board and setup. I'll let him talk about it. So I also have the same Rode Podcaster USB mic, uh, which I use when I'm traveling or when I have to not have the other set up for some reason. It's fantastic. I'm actually right now on an Amazon Basics mic that they no longer make at my shop. That's also uh, amazing okay. for a USB mic. Mm -hmm. um, the setup I use uh, normally is actually from Alicia White of the Embedded.fm podcast. Uh, it's their old setup, which is the Rode Podcaster XLR mic and the Scarlett, I believe it's the iX5. Uh, mixer and mic to USB interface. All right. And you record into what? We record straight uh, into Audacity and okay. then we do multi-track editing for post. All right. Well, thank you. You've answered my question very <laughs> thoroughly. It's wonderful that, and I'm glad that Zoom allows us the, the opportunity to have out of town guests. And uh, someday, uh, you know, the part of the world that you live in is very exotic to me, who's been in the, I've been here in the Pacific Northwest for for uh, 40 years. Have you ever been out to uh, to Oregon or, or Washington? And what was most striking to you about our geology out here? So my friend and I took three of our four children, one of them didn't exist yet, um, on a 6,000 mile road trip to Oregon and Washington, um, which was crazy, but also awesome. And we camped on um, the Northern part of California on the coast, right outside of Crescent City. And the coolest part was telling my friend who is not science inclined, she's a first grade teacher and can care less about me rattling on about science. Um, not because she's a first grade teacher, but just because she doesn't care about me talking. <laughs> and I said, do you see these rocks up here? All those big boulders, those are from tsunamis. And she said, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so I got the whole, like do the whole like full rip nine talk and all that jazz. And I don't think she slept for two weeks. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> so just actually like getting to see the tsunami deposits up on the wall of that canyon was the coolest thing. And we stayed at Mount Rainier for a week. And so we never saw the top of the mountain. And I've flown into Seattle a few times and I've always seen the top. And then I saw the bottom when we stayed there. So I don't believe it actually exists. It's one thing. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's that's reasonable skepticism it seems yeah. to me yeah we often don't see the mountain for a long time yeah and i've never actually had the opportunity to go to the pacific northwest uh, it's the only segment of the country that i've never been to but that's going to change soon uh, because i've got to go up there for a training class here in a few months and that'll be my first time up there so i'm looking for some good places to go see well, we have some recommendations. Uh, we would, of course, always recommend Dr. Bill Orr's book of Oregon Geology and Dr. Molly Miller's uh, Roadside Geology of Oregon. And we've got a few field, field trip guides on our, uh, on our website, gsoc.org, for, for people to, to peruse. John and Shannon, you are as delightful in person <laughs> as you are in my ears when I'm out <laughs> pulling weeds. So thank you for making the time. Um, we're going to, in just a couple seconds, I'm going to have Carol turn off the recording. I don't see a lot of questions in the chat. This is the time where I have to, you know, step outside and uh, check the oil on the internet just to, because I've been sitting here for two and a half hours. So um, uh, again, I, I want to thank you and, uh, and Andrew also for your, your wonderful work today. Uh, Carol, I'm going to have you turn off the recording.